everybody doing? Good, good, excellent. I'm Patty Armbruster, and uh, Robin Kelson kind of threw me in the fire here. Uh, I taught teachers this morning for uh, three hours to um, them to know how to work with kids and teach them how to how to farm in school. Life skill we lost. I'm an agricultural education teacher over in Minnesota, and I also run a very improvement consultant business. And I took Elaine Ingham, so life and soil classes, and certified by her. So most of what you see here is presented is uh, her knowledge transferred to her students, and then her students are transferred hopefully to the world. And so she's in this book. I recommend this book to everybody that I come across. The Soil Will Save Us. It's one of the few books that actually has some answers, great answers, and you are part of the answer. And so. It's a great book to read. Um, Kirsten also, if you just put in the soil will save us, you'll get the book in the web easily. Okay, so I uh, didn't know I was doing this until yesterday. <laughs> so this, uh, this will be a little organic, but I'm an organic teacher, so it's okay. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, uh, I'm doing Elaine's method of composting, but that doesn't mean that I don't know lots of other composting methods. So, I learned the donut composting method at uh, the Occidental Art and Ecology Center in California. I've seen uh, the same method that um, Will Allen uses at the Growing Power. I do a lot of traveling with the agricultural education stuff, so I know several methods. I've done the lazy method, throw it out there, <laughs> away two or three years, and then eventually, yeah, it's great stuff, right? Well, I found out after Lane's classes, it wasn't quite as great as it could have been, that's for sure, because the biology wasn't there. So I'm going to teach you a little bit, I'm going to show you quite a bit about the biology, because that's the pretty cool stuff. It's stuff we can't see, right? So it's harder for us to want to get excited and learn because we can't see it. And so we're, we're trying to bring back something ancient, the time the Peru farmers was able to farm for 1,500 years sustainably, with just digging sticks. Compost, manure, and ash. We can do this. Okay, this book will help you learn how to do it, and hopefully, my information will help you a little bit. Uh, lots of people don't have their goal. <laughs> we have to have their goal. Improve the soil. Improve so, our garden improve soil. Soil improvement and to grow your own food and be grow sustainable our own and food. less waste. Going into the dumping, for example, or we whatever. want to close the cycle, right? Yeah, that's so best kind of what, recycling available. Use every single thing. Very good. More than once. Yes, and what we produce in our own household needs to get into this compost, mm -hmm. and then when you need more resources, we can go get it in the community. But get your own circle closed, right? Pay attention to your own work first. And, you know, they put a lot of pressure on agricultural producers mm -hmm. to feed the world. You cannot imagine the weight of the students that I teach and their parents from that that's false. But they have that weight on their shoulders. That forces them to make decisions that aren't that good a decision. We cannot, we don't have to do that. Right? And they don't need that weight. They need to learn how to feed themselves first. Right now they do not know how. And most people don't. We've lost that skill in society. We're going to gain it back. We are going to gain it back. So we're going to do this. Okay, so everybody got their own goal, right? Perfect. Um, my One of my goals is teach kids how to compost, teach as many adults as I possibly can teach, and I teach teachers. Because every teacher I teach, I figure I've reached thousands. Instead of, I teach an average class of five students. right? So I'm not going to get anywhere with where I'm at, but I know how to get out and get to other teachers. So. But I enjoy you guys coming and appreciate you coming today and hope that you get something out of this. Okay, so soil health. Essentially, all life depends upon soil. There can be no life without soil and no soil without life. They have evolved together. Charles E. Pollock. I don't know how we got so far away from this. Um, I come from production ag, right? I was born on a production agricultural operation in Michigan, but it was extremely diverse from strawberries to sweet corn to beef to meat rabbits to spelts to clover. It's not that way today. 
It's all monocultures. All right, we're gonna get a, we gotta get back to put life in soil because they've done a good job of killing it. But we're gonna get it back. Okay, so healthy soil, we're gonna have a healthy life. Okay, there is Oh, I don't know what I was doing. I was asleep when I did. I don't know what that is. <laughs> so, some things for sure I can usually entertain when I don't know what else. <laughs> All right, so we need to close your cycle, just like you're talking about, that we need to fully understand we're connected to the soil and the soil is connected to us. And, oh, there is no way. That's what I was trying to make a point in this. There's no way. Right? Out in eastern Montana, we don't have any recycling. It's going to the landfill, but that's not a way. It's creating methane and all kinds of stuff, right? There's no way. They're importing waste from the oil fields into our country, into Montana. It's not a way, it's still here, right? So we gotta close all that stuff up, all right? So plants, this is one thing we're doing even wrong in just basic uh, organic gardening. This, We've got to give back to the soil microbes. When I was a child, my dad would say, we've got to give 50% back. Right, so when we go out there and harvest that alfalfa, we're not going to go after every little piece. We've got to give some of it back. If we didn't give it back, we're going to take the cow manure out there and give it back. We've got to give it back. All right, so I'm going to teach people to only take 75% in the beginning because you can't see your soil light, so you don't know if they're there. You can send it out to a lab or somebody like myself, and we charge you $60 per soil sample to find out, and we'll tell you. But um, you can do this without that. But we're going to have to get back to do that because those soil microbes need fed. All right, so at least 50% after we get up and going, good, good and healthily. Right? If we're an organic farmer, what are we picking and taking away? What part of the plant are we taking away? The seed. The seed. The flower. The fruit. The energy. All right. In nature, that wouldn't have all went away. You know, an animal would have come and took some, but that wouldn't have all went away. So we got to think, we got to think that, put that in our minds. That's what we're going to do. Okay, so with composting, we're, we're able to get back better than what we took, actually. Amazing, because we can make the compost into what we want it to be especially with the microscope, uh, for sure with the microscope, right? And the more diversity we put in the compost, you're gonna to to get sick of that word. The more diversity of soil life, we're gonna get back out. In nature, how many plants do you think is out in the prairie? In nature, a healthy system. I just drove 450 some miles to get here and I'm gonna go back that same road. I did not see very many healthy <coughs> systems, but in a healthy system, how many plants in a prairie? Hundreds. Hundreds. At least they say a minimum of 140. Yeah. That's diversity, right? 140 plants in this room space, in our garden space. How many plants are in your garden? Are they in a straight row and they're all <laughs> tomatoes? They're here. So this afternoon, if you stick around, I'll teach you where to mix those up. But we're going to have to have that same type of diversity into this compost. Because we're feeding a diverse world under there. And if it's not diverse under there, we've got to get it diverse under there. And the only way we're going to do that is bring in diversity back into the system that they need. So we're going to be thinking that way. This is your best resource. Elaine Ingham wrote this uh, Compost Tea Brewing Manual, it's free on the web, it's a PDF download. At the back of this uh, slideshow, the source is there. If somebody wants this, um, you can uh, we'll get a tablet up here. If you want to email, give me your email, I'll email you this slideshow. How many, is, how many people have heard Elaine speak? Just one of us? Two of us? Yeah, videos. Um, that's great. And uh, wow. I drove 350 miles to hear her speak. Priceless. 
The lady's a genius. Where is she? Is she here in the valley? Where is she? No, she is uh, oof, originally from Wisconsin or Minnesota. She lives in northern um, or southern Oregon. Mm-hmm. She lives on the road, mm-hmm. traveling all over the world, giving this presentation. Not exactly this one, but hers. About an hour and 20 minutes or so on the web to watch it. And um, you can watch her present to a permaculture, to organic growers, to regular farmers, to gardeners, to everybody to, in the world. And every time I watch her, I learn something new. And I took her course, took a, the course for a year. I took it a year and a half ago. And every time I do something with her, I learn something new. So use your free resources on the web. Get in there and start learning from her. She has not took the time to write a book nor go on the TED stage. But she's presenting to large auditoriums for people and they report it freely, so. Okay, so um, we're to make compost wherever you can. It's kind of like school gardens or farms, every one's gonna be different. So whatever your situation is, that's what you'll do. Um, the lady that's getting the um, food waste from the community and from Glacier Park, She's doing a great big windrows. Have to for the volume. Right? This is great for a backyard setting because it still looks good and doesn't um, take up much space. It's stackable. Mm-hmm. So I stack this in three stations. It's in its middle station right now. And so this cardboard is on top of a pallet. And so when I'm going to turn this pile, it's going to go to that next one. And then we'll turn it back. And then I actually can actually start a second pile while this one's still cooking. So I try to get efficient even though I'm tiny, right? This is a four foot by three foot square area, but it still ends up being quite a bit of compost if I'm going to make compost tea out of it. Who knows the difference between compost tea and compost? I was just going to ask you, can you explain the, the process? Excuse my okay. Yeah. Yeah, those are just cedar boards. Um, I made it with my egg kids in the shop, so it's uh, three foot wide. You could make it four foot wide to get more space, but the three foot's easier for kids to stack. So a 12 inch board, a one by 12 cedar board, not that I'm promoting cutting cedar trees because I don't believe in that either, but <laughs> I didn't want a compost bin that will last and be good at, on a schoolyard or a backyard. And so then that you know, we made four rings that we do have ones that are five rings. Because when you build the pile, you're going to have that much, and it's going to break down relatively quickly, and you'll start taking the racks off. I notice you have a screen on top. Is that for sifting? That's to keep the cats up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you have bottoms on those? Or are you saying each one is? Uh... Each one's the same. Um, there's a pallet on the bottom. I think I got some videos in different, so I might show a little bit more. But so this this is. This one, the top one's going to come set on this one. And then as I turn the pile into that one, I stack the next one and turn more of the pile. And then pretty soon the second pile, station number two, is stacked with a thermometer and then back cooking again. Every time you turn it, it's going to recook, reheat up. And over time, um, when this is done, we're going to be third under half the volume in 21 days with Elaine's method. This is a hot thermal method. It's called the hot thermal composting method. Okay, does anybody know the difference between compost tea and compost? I'm gonna guess, it's just water in with the compost. Anybody else? You soak the compost in water and then you drain it. And then you take the water and use it. Okay, that's extract. Good, good example of extract. And you kind of aerate it, don't you? Put air- you got to aerate it to get compost tea. And why we're <laughs> aerating it is the mass multiply because they're having a grand old party in there. <laughs> yeah, in thousand times production from our compost to the compost tea. Mm-hmm. Right, so it's a matter of your goal again. My goal is to go in and put compost tea down two or three times a year, and that's my only amendment. I'm not adding fertilizer, I'm not adding seaweed, I'm not adding commoner, because I don't, I'm in a yard situation. I'm not adding that, so I'm adding the compost tea. The soil life is in the tea, I'm gonna to get to that here in a second. Um, the extract works great, but the extract's just extracting exactly what's in the compost out of it, 
and into your water application. Okay, so which is fine if your compost has exactly what you want, but if you really need microbes, why would you put one percent in when you could put a thousand percent in 24 hours later? To start rebuilding the system. And if we have compaction, Every farmer I know, every farmer is panicking, every farmer has got big problems with compaction. These guys undo compaction. So we want a thousand if you got the time to make the tea group. Simple, five gallon jug and or, you know, I didn't actually bring a picture of that stuff because I didn't have time, but you can get it on the web. I'll show you the resources. Uh, so it can look like anything, right? It's what you got. Don't go out and buy a bunch of new stuff for it. It's, you can do it wherever, right? This uh, this was the first school one we had, and we just put up pallets. Uh, this one is just a cement wire cage, and that was after it had cooked in the big bin there, this, this bin, and it got half the, the size. It was 21 days old. I didn't want it set and taken up my station because I wanted to make more, so I took it out of the station and put it in the cement wire, and then I could made a donut to open it up in the center so it can aerate because the microbes are all alive in there and they need oxygen. You don't want it to dry out, but you don't want it to be suffocating either. So the donut lets them break down the system more and gets it more refined. You can see it's quite coarse. It's coarse also because of the recipe of what I put in it. So you'll make a recipe to meet your goals of what you want to grow with your carbon and nitrogen ratio. And we'll talk a little bit more here. Um, anytime somebody's got a burning question, throw your hand in there because I'll like it. Okay. Use all your own waste first, so close your own cycle. Okay. There's, um, I start with a uh, Shredded paper from the school, cardboard waste from the school, wood shavings from my community. Uh, the guy that cuts trees for the power guy, I'm the only person that he knows because I don't let him talk to anybody else. No. <laughs> like, yes, you are my friend, and yes, you can dump your stuff right here. <laughs> and he's got to pay fuel to go take it away to dump it. So I make friends with him. A free source. Um, your commercial tree trimmers, too, they have a lot of it, and they usually are free source. They're, they've got a lot of general places that we really like. Okay, so this is kind of the baseline goal that they talk about on the internet, and Elaine talks about the same thing as the 30 to 1, but it also depends on your goal. Um, goals meaning what's wrong with my soil, do I have soil life, do I, or what soil life do I have, and what am I going to grow? Right? If I'm wanting to grow vegetables, but I have annual weeds, I have a big goal that i got to get from succession one with the weeds to the vegetable succession. So I'm jumping successions by what's in the compost and what soil life's in the compost. Does everybody understand the successions? Okay. So let's start there because that's crucial that we understand the successions. So... When we have a tilling event, Mother Nature doesn't do it often. Humans do it quite often. Some of us think we've got to do it three or four times a year. Um, some of us think we can't garden without doing it. And I teach no-till classes, and I just, after two times, and I get everybody to read that book, and after they read that book, they come to my next class, and they're like, time out. So I have to say another word. I'm on board. What do I do? They said, um... You know what? I gotta call the neighbor every time I want to get the tiller out. I said I got an answer for that. And they're like, really? What is that? Sell the tiller. And they're like, sell my tiller? I'm like, yes. You do not need it, and it's destroying your soil life. Way different psychology, right? So I just tell everybody when I start with adult ed, forget everything you already know about agriculture. Forget about it. They're like, excuse me? Like, yes. Because it's so different. We're going to work with nature, and we're going to rebuild nature with the compost. Don't feel bad. Everybody else is silent when I get done talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a 31 
carbon to nitrogen ratio is is the baseline. It's kind of the safety zone. Yes. What was the succession thing? Oh yes, yeah, succession. Wow, we got to wait. We only got to the tilling succession. All right. So okay. So when we till up the soil, okay. Who knows about mycorrhizae rising? Yes. If we till up the mycorrhizae rising, we destroyed it. It's gone. All that fungal network is gone. Right, if you come to my next class, you'll learn a lot more about that. Mycorrhizae and the soil life, you know, that we got to have that. Because what happened 200 years ago? Who took the fertilizer spreader out there? Who did it? Absolutely nobody other than the bison and the deer, the antelope. No, the microbes are doing it all. Elaine starts her workshop right from the beginning, the very beginning. Every single ounce of soil on this planet has the nutrients in it to grow the plants. It's got to have the microbes to release those nutrients for the plant. If that doesn't happen, you're not growing plants unless you give it drugs, NPK, and other stuff they don't give them. It's like weaning off drugs, too. So if you've been using a lot of seaweed or a lot of any nitrogens or whatever, you have to be slower about this transition. You can't just, I'm doing it because, wow, next year you might be saying, I'm broke. <laughs> we don't want you to do that. So session one, after the tilling event, what happens? Weeds, more weeds. Annual weeds. It's Mother Nature's way of saying, oh my gosh, we got to protect that soil. Don't let it blow away. Don't let it rain on it and run it away. Cover it up as fast as possible by billions of weed seeds. And I don't care if you stop doing whatever you're doing 100 years from now, those weed seeds are still going to be there. Mother Nature has planned this for millions of years. That if there's a tilling event, she's going to plant weeds to rebuild the system, to start feeding the microbes and get it back going again. Right, so tilling causes the weeds. So you're creating the weeds if we're going to go till. So we got to get over that. Then we get over that, we get to the next succession. Let's say in that first succession we have pigweed, annual, red rip, pigweed, lamb's quarter, stuff like that, right? I was on an organic farm today, last summer, he's not going. And he had a monster annual weed problem. I'm like, wow, this has cost a lot of labor. I'm an efficient person. I'm a business planner, and I'm like, we've got a problem. We've got to reduce the labor costs because we're pulling annual weeds. Granted, they make good compost if they're not in seed. <laughs> That's not cost effective. We're pulling them because we're fighting nature because we're still in the succession of weeds because in the fall, it goes right back to tilt again. I would go right back. We lost six months now. We went right back again. All right, so the next succession, what are we going to get to grow in the next succession? It's got a taproot. What's got a taproot? Dandelions. Yes, dandelions. Okay, mullen. They're rebuilding the system. Undoing the compaction that you created. All right, getting some oxygen in the air, some water channels to go down where that taproot is. And feed the system, feed the microbes. All right, so we just go from one succession to the next. So we're in a weed succession. Then we get into the Baracus family, so your kales. So if you've been tilling a lot and you need to make money on your organic farm, you'd want to plant a lot of Baracuses where you're wanting to transition into natural farming because they will grow without mycorrhizal rising. They don't need it. In fact, you could buy it and it wouldn't do you any good. The next succession does. Okay, we get into our vegetables then. And so some of us, that's where we want to live. If we live in the vegetable succession, we'll be able to grow all of our organic crops. If we want to grow a lot of grain, we need to move up a little bit into the next succession of grasses. So if you look out in your garden, you're like, geez, why do I have all this grass? I can look, tell you under the microscope why you have all that grass. You're in the grass succession. But you as a common 
primary, you can see the graphs. You know you should be in it, unless it's crabgrass. Crabgrass is back at the first assessment. So we've got to get to know our soil, we've got to get to know our plants, we've got to get to know what's out there. This 30 to 1 is a safe zone right in the vegetable grass line. If you make your compost to be balanced at 30 to 1, then that's where you're at. But if you've been tilling for 10 or 15 or 50 years, or 75, then you're going to need to get supercharged with more fungal than this. Okay, so it depends what your goal is, right? And each spot's going to be different. Okay, this is a, a cargo rule that I wrote forever until I got to know him in class. I'm like, mm, don't mix them together until you're ready to make the hot compost. Because when we mix it together, we're made a recipe to create the compost, and the biology is going to start reproducing and make all that heat. So we want to control that. We want to do that ourselves. So you're going to mix them by layering. Um, Elaine's got a great video, um, Elaine Ingham composting or compost tea. It's only like 20 minutes long. It really gets you very knowledgeable very fast. And so they, they're showing you the recipe and how they blend them and how you mix them together. And it takes quite a bit of water, right? You've got to have some water. Build it up. They are using cement wire in different ways. Their piles on the left the side. Your pile will end up whatever you want. You do want to have enough mass to create the heat, though. So you don't want to have, okay, it's just the size of this chair. Not going to work because you got too much air around it for the microbes to cause that much heat. We got to get up to the 160 degrees in, in, with the in nearby long compost thermometer to measure that. Got to get to the 160. At 160, we kill the bad bugs, bad biology, and we kill the weed seeds. Under 160, we're reproducing those and spreading them in our compost. So we, we've got to get to the 160. The only way to get to the 160 is to do it right and blend them, blend the recipe together. So, like, I think I got some pictures here. There's a, a thermometer. Here is uh, definitely at the upper edge, right? We're at almost 180. I found out I kind of live there. I'm like, wow, <laughs> I'm just not turning this stuff fast enough. Turns out it was my recipe because my recipe is way more fungal because I want to jump clear to that grass accession from destroyed grounds and compacted grounds. So I put a lot more wood chips in it, a lot more um, leaves and cardboard. Those are all your 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 cardboard carbon components. Everybody understand the difference between the nitrogen ones and the carbon ones? So your brown materials are your carbons and your nitrogens are your alfalfa hay, your peas, your your manures. That's where you'll look up on the web what, what uh, carbon ratio. There's a list on the web of all the different carbon ratios for each part of your recipe. So I'll go through a recipe and say, okay, I've got brewer's mash from the brewery. I got coffee grounds from the coffee place. I'm the best friends with them too. Nobody else can so see yeah. better. It's because they're a resource that's in my area. And I to find out you're gonna be coming for a good gatherer, you know, every time you go to town you come back with composting components and then you store them until spring. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I was wanting really high fungal. Because in order to get out of the problem, my gardeners have created, i got to get over that. So I went way over toward almost the tree succession. So after the grass succession is your berry bushes, choke cherries, smaller trees, your your prairie, out on your prairie, your sagebrush and stuff, that's the next, next succession. Then your deciduous <coughs> trees, then your conifers, and finally your old growth forest. An old growth forest, 500 years or older, they're classifying as. So that secession is from zero to 500 years, right? And we keep living in zero year when we till. We want to get over there to the, about the 20 year mark where the grass line is at with the vegetables. Are you concerned about when gathering your browns and your greens for your, your recipe mm -hmm. of gathering? Uh, you know, um, 
contaminated uh, fruits, vegetables from others it's in terms, or is it going to, or the temperature going to kill it? The, well, depends on what is in it. It's like know your farmer, right? In my neck of the wood, you better know your farmer really well. What's in this chemical tank? What's it doing? It's got rodeo and some of those extremely dangerous stuff in it. I used to know that farmer and have nothing to do with them. Right? If he's using a more normal practice, that that stuff will get out of the straw or whatever it is that you're putting into the compost, then it's okay. If you can get it from your organic farmer, that's the best. Better yet, grow it yourself. Grow ryegrass. Triticale. Oh my gosh, the microorganisms love triticale. Put it in your cover crop. Sigh your cover crop. Put that in the compost. Leave the roots in the ground and stubble in the ground to break down in the ground or that you're improving that soil. Take how much away? 25% the first year till we can get that biology built up. Yes? Oh, I just want to ask you, um, sometimes we use composted manure, right? Mm -hmm. Well, even some people like to add it to the compost piles. Yes. And other people just top dress. But if it's added to the compost pile, do you consider that nitrogen then? Yes. But you'll look it up on the web. If it's commoner and it's dry and old, its nitrogen to carbon ratio is going to be different than fresh coming out of the cow. Okay, but better know your farmer. What goes in the cow and the chicken is coming out. Right, so if it's a the systemic chemical went into that product that the cow ate or horse, horse yet, monograssic's not going to get rid of it at all. You just put it in your compost. Some of them last for decades. They're not even sure how long some of them last. So don't get them in the first place. So, got is, really so is there concern them. then if you go and go to your rosars and all the you know and all the different? Uh, I wouldn't go there. I would not go there. When I go into a regular grocery, uh, regular grocery, I can't agree. That's like a grocery. So when I go into a greenhouse, I'll go right to the manager and says, "Hey, is there any neonicotinoids in this?" product. And they're like, holy crap. Let me get the manager. <laughs> they send somebody out that's got a whole lot more knowledge than them. And he may come out and coat ties and guarantee you there is not. If he knows what's going on in the industry, that they are not in his greenhouse. If you don't do that, you can count on your getting them. Because they're on the seed tree. It's going on all your bedding plants. So just don't go get it from them unless you know that person well enough, right? Know the farmer, know the greenhouse guy. What are they putting in there? It's not going away. We get it back. We don't want to put it in our cycle. That's why if you can keep your cycle at home, that's way much better, right? So if we can grow our fodder, grow our own straw, grow our own hay to go into the compost, grow our own hay for the mulch. If not, get to know your big organic farmer really close to you. Get to know cardboard. Good. <laughs> you know, you hear about cardboard and the layering and that. Yes, and we'll talk about that in the next class. I oh. use a lot of cardboard. Okay. But do you worry about I mean, uh, obviously that's process. I worry about it if it's been in China very long, the cardboard. I guess the thing is, do you know typically if you boxes, break down boxes and such? How do you? Yeah, know? I usually get them from the furniture store in the school. They're big. Uh -huh. you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next class for you if you want to join us. Uh, it's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we can get American made cardboard, that'd be all I would buy or all I would use. But right now we're in this, this weird zone. We might be able to control that. What about burlap? Would that be two fibers? Um, I don't think anything is too, too horribly fibrous as long as you can kind of chop it up some, right? I've done some pretty, pretty poor stuff because I'm wanting to jump these sessions. Okay, so this is, uh, the biology. This is what's causing our heat. I don't know if I can get this to do what I want it to do. Maybe. Oh, we're going to have to shut the lights off and get a lot darker in here, Linda, if you can. Those as dark as we're going to go. Okay, so this is a slide of uh, at probably 40x, which is 400 times the view with this microscope. You've got to get that much power 
to see what we need to see. So don't buy just the everyday microscope. I, the first year I was doing this, and I went to the school, and I'm like, hey, we have a microscope that will go to 40 X. And they're like, are you crazy? No. <laughs> so $400 later, but well worth the money, is one that will. And so this is um, the amber looking stuff in the middle is a soil aggregate, the biology especially the bacteria starting to glue it together. They're gluing together food stuff for the future. They're great at it too. And that's what we want them to do because those aggregates are gluing our soil together and they're making it exactly what we want it to be. Because then it's gonna be a sponge for nutrients and water. It's gonna release those nutrients in the water when we get in a drought. But when we till, we destroy that. That little shiny thing right here, all those shiny things, that's sand, to give you an idea how tiny this stuff is. And then uh, when we start this slide, um, silt smaller than sand, right? So we can see a little bit of silt in there. We might be able to see, I don't think we're barely seeing clay, just a little bit, it's like a speck, it's almost smaller than the, than the bacteria in the slide to give you an idea of our compaction of clay. You might have to get close. This is better on the computer screen, but can you see it moving? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's that's the microbiology. Um, some of it's bacteria, some of it is stuff I cannot identify because I'm not trained to, nor do I have a scope that we'll see a thousand times to see what that stuff is. <laughs> But it's all natural and all what we are looking for. So in the more of those soil aggregates we've got, the better off we are. And that focusing, you think when you put it put together a slide and you put a drop, one drop of water with soil life in it, and then you put a slip cover over the top of it, you think, I'm gonna see right through that stuff. So guess what? There's about 20 views of focusing to go down through that layer of that. That's how much soil life is in there. You're just like, wow. Okay, so that's what we want in there. That's part of what we want to show you more. Here's, a, here's another of that stack. You know, this isn't getting to be a cool season. This was October. I didn't want my heat escaping, so I put a cardboard over the top. <coughs> hey, and this is a little video. This is uh, about three to four days into it. You better be planning on having to turn it, right? If you don't, you didn't do it right, right? You should be heating in that amount of time. This is October. <coughs> So air temperature in the 30s, low 40s, and um, everything's wet that we put in there. We've got to have it wet to, to create the activity. Um, I crumbled up some uh, brewer's waste, and it's taken me probably five or six batches to understand what I should be doing or not doing with brewer's waste. Great resource because the guy's got tons of it. He's got more than I can use. In fact, I give it to the chicken people so I can get chicken manure back and trade so that I, one uh, barrel, 50 gallon barrel of, of uh, lake, uh, brewer's mash is gonna be more than we need. A lot, it's hot. It's so hot, that's why we were up at 180 degrees when we wanna live in the 160 degree. So you need to use it finely. Um, it says it's 16 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio, but I don't think it's hotter than that. So. Okay, so, but use what you have, right? What's in your local area? Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, this is what we really are looking for. And you was talking about um, the uh, burlap and coarser fiber materials from trees and stuff. Well, in nature, what shreds that up is this guy at the top, and that's a micro That's at 5x, 
under the microscope, which would be 50 times. And they're really big. But they're, I can't reproduce them. Nobody can. They're in your environment. So they're already in my compost. I think they're coming from my trees I shredded is where I'm getting Because I got them in all of my compost piles. So it's like, because yes. you can't hire them. You can't <laughs> employ them. <laughs> so you want to you wanna get them. So if you get them in a, in a compost pile and you have them, then you'd use that as a starter for your next one. Once we get what we want, we just, it's kind of like a sourdough. <laughs> <laughs> sourdough. You keep it, you take a little bit, add it to the next pile. You've inoculated with the good stuff, and now you're going to reproduce it. This, uh, what's this guy? Nematode. Good, a nematode. Mm -hmm. And what kind of nematode? Okay, there's all you hear about is the bad nematodes, right? Especially in uh, down in Florida, they've got bad nematodes. I mean, all the research is for the bad nematodes to get rid of the bad nematodes. There is bad nematodes, but there's five of them, and we like to have four of them present. We don't really want a root feeder. This is not good, does it? We don't want the root feeder. But if we do have the root feeder, we need this guy. This is a predatorial nematode, and he's going to eat the root feeding nematode. We do want the bacterial feeding nematodes, because how fast does the bacteria reproduce? Blinding fast. I, I'm not a biologist, but it's so fast that we better have something eating it. Right? Lots of them. So we want this guy. These guys are hard to find. I found very few of them but I have one compost batch that's got a lot of them in it, and so what am I going to do with it? You're going to save some and use it for the next guy. Hey, excellent. So do, yeah. you, do you check? With the microscope. With a microscope, then, to notice that is so Yes, and then there's a great big Excel spreadsheet that you record all that on, and then you can save that. And I number my uh, uh, compost batches by 16A. That was the first one I did in 2016, 16B and I went to 16F last year making batches. Okay, so this year the first one I'll do will be 17A, so I can keep track of it. And so on the spreadsheet, that's what it'll say. Uh, compost pile 17A, and then on the next sheet in the spreadsheet, it will list the ingredients in the carbon and nitrogen ratios that I put in it, the recipe. So if I hit a home run, yeah, look like a genius because I could do it again. <laughs> Otherwise, what happens? It's uh, just random. Yeah. Just like, man, <laughs> what, what did I put in there last year? Because, wow, that stuff's the greatest stuff ever. Now I can't remember what I did. Yeah. <laughs> so use the technology to help yourself. This next one over here, anybody guess? What's this clear stuff? Aggregate. Oh, oh clear. It is a fungus, mycorrhizal rhizae. And you guys need to look it up. What is mycorrhizal rhizae? Because it's key to your success. It is a network going under the ground, connecting every plant in the network. And they're communicating and feeding themselves through this network. They're just getting to start to really understand it. They've been studying it for a long time, but not enough people studying it. It's so tiny, 400x right there, <laughs> to see the little tiny clear stuff. And these little dots are the seeds. Big Ag is buying it by big time because they've destroyed it all. So they're like, we need it back. So they're buying it. They're going to buy it. They're paying big money to get it. The only way it's going to work is if they don't till it yet. Even their sweeps on the front of their air drill. Don't do that. How do you buy it? I mean, honestly, without there's destroying a, somebody else's topsoil. No, there, there's a company, they reproduce it. So it's, is it a synthetic reproduction? No. Or natural? Nope. I even, um, some okay. science kids and I made some in the house. Okay. okay, so there's a lab. Um, I think they're in Oregon. If you look up Microfries Rising and you get it in YouTube, you'll, you'll find it. I'll, I'll try to add the source to this. Yes. So I'm just a home gardener. Yes. And I try to compost before that I do it very poorly. Uh-huh. Uh, which is why I like to come here and figure out maybe some things that would make my compost work better. Yes. I don't have a microscope. Yes. And I'm not going to look to see that I have this stuff growing in more improvement in the soil. 
kind of augment it so they yep. can do a better job. So what can you tell me that's going to help my compost process to be better that might allow me to perhaps produce these things even though I don't know they're going to be in it? That's right. Most of you won't know they're in there, and I brought some compost for you to smell and look at. And you're going to start connecting with your senses and the land again. Right? If I see a dandelion growing, it's telling me something. My ground is compacted. Right. So so then I'm going to keep adding more compost until the dandelions aren't there. Right? So it's kind of working with nature. And so you're, back to your, just your basic compost thing, you're going to do the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Say you have 10 products. Say I have leaves, cardboard, wood branches, waste paper, um, kitchen waste, garden waste, coffee grounds, and brewer's mash. That's a recipe, right? And the carbon to nitrogen ratio, I'm going to need three parts paper to one part nitrogen, and you're going to use the carbon to nitrogen ratio off the internet to balance it. Or you can do it kind of the cowboy way, I call it, and just guess and hope for the best, which is fine. And lots of people might do that. But if you would do the carbon to nitrogen ratio, take a little bit of time to educate yourself better, you'd understand, well, that cardboard is 101 or 175 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So I'm not going to need that much um, more carbon. I'm going to need nitrogen to offset it to get back to the 30 to 1. But yep, Elaine's video on how to make compost will get you a long ways into what you want to know, just watching the video. And you'll make the recipe, then you blend the recipe together, two or three days later, heats up to 160, you turn it, because what's happening to the outside of the pile? It's drying out. And it's now getting cold. And exposed there, and cold. And it's not 160 degrees. So we... Take the top off, put it in a tub, turn the pile, so now the hot part's on the outside, the cold part's on the inside, mix the cold part top back in it before I finish turning it. So it's like kneading bread. we got to get that top in the middle and the middle on the outside each time we turn. We're going to turn a minimum of six times, five, six times. Why? We have one side here, one side there, one side here, one side there, and a top. That's a minimum of five times. If you want to turn the bottom, that's six times. In order to get everything heated to the 160 degrees, because that's going to kill all of your weeds and your bad bacteria and bad human diseases, right? And anything else that might get in there that we don't want, except for chemicals that we can't deal with. But we're going to, we're going to need it to get to 160, everything. You do that, and you won't need to have this stuff or the microscope. But you will need to tell, listen, five minutes okay, five thank you, minutes you will questions. need to listen to your plants and pay attention to your soil, okay? There, there'll be resources on here if you'd like them to help. Yeah, this is like a eight year or PhD education, right? <laughs> to, there's so much to know, but I'm trying to scale it down so hopefully help you be able to do the basics. Okay, so these kids are doing a donut style one. It's kind of more of the lazy method, but it works and works fine. I learned this lesson in this way in California. It still is a hot thermal pile, just usually isn't as tense because it gets kind of spread out. But. So you put the sticks and the heavy stuff and the stuff that didn't break down before in the bottom. That's inoculating the pile with what was on the last pile you made. Keep doing that. Some stuff might take two or three or four times to break down. Great. I'm getting all that biology from each time that it worked with other plants into there. So that's a win-win. But it needs to go in the bottom, helps aerate the pile, because you need aeration. And then we start layering it. Uh, brown, green, brown, green, and water on everything. What's that in the middle? That's a, that's a, a tube to aerate it. You, just, you take it out after you got it built because you want the air in it this is a donut style so it's got a hole in the middle to get more air in there you have to turn it because the microbes have used up the air and they have to have air if they don't they start dying or we get the bad microbes so we need the oxygen so that this is just a different method it gets more oxygen in the pile then the stacking method we showed you earlier 
in the big ones, they're they're turning it with a compost turner, right? They go through and they turn invert the pile. <coughs> it's got to get turned. Uh, this is just a polyculture, getting people to understand that we have to think diversity because we can let this, these plants, these diverse plants, break down in the system right where they're at, and we've created those microbes right there. Didn't even do the work. So it's your goal. What is your goal? If you only want to create microbes, you plant massive cover crop with lots of diversity in it and let it all break down in the system. And you're creating microbes like crazy. You don't need the microscope. But you're going to have to keep doing it. You, you, you can only take away one crop if you're only going to give one back if you're doing it every other year. Um, it's best to get it from your local environment. No different than our food. Right? If we get our food from our local environment out of our own soils, we have our own microbes. And we're living together. It's the healthiest way to live. We've proved that over time. Let's see in the, the book, The Dirt, the, the Erosion of Civilization. Uh, is priceless if somebody wants to take the time to read it by David Montgomery. It should get everybody alarmed and ready to do something. Dirt, the erosion of civilizations, goes through time. What went wrong with these civilizations because of their dirt? Um, okay, any questions? No, it's a crash course. What yes, the name of that last author, please? David Montgomery. Thank you. What was the name of the book? Dirt, the Erosion of Civilizations. And his other book, if you really get into the soil, will save us. Um, the Hidden Half of Nature is phenomenal by David Montgomery. The Hidden Half of Nature. Yes? Do you have any suggestions for composting in the woods to keep it? Animals or bears with it. Bears, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess. I've had like burying it, but then it doesn't have air. Or no, it water. can't. You can't bury it. You're gonna have to fence it somehow. Or like they don't like electric fence, but I really have good electric fence, all right. I just like by not putting, making sure I don't have any um, animal products. Yeah, in it. or eggs or any of that stuff that attracts them. Might help. Yeah. yeah. And once it heats up, um, you can get it to heat. Then the the change in the smell changes, right? I had a wooden cover for mine, and it was quite heavy. And I had it behind a garage, and then I had a big hook because they're quite clever and they can open different things. Where I could wire just a quick wire, it took a few seconds. Where they couldn't pop the hook, and it was heavy. And when it was heavy, when I sometimes I had to get help to get it up there, and then I also could hook it against my garage while I was working, and I had it split into two bins nice. where I could flip it over. And it wasn't big volume, but it was a good way to recycle wet waste because you're just paying yourself back. Instead of paying to get rid of that waste, you're using it, and you're getting paid by what you're not buying in fertilizers and other things. Yeah, so exactly. you're paying yourself with the effort. Did you have some questions? I was just wondering about if you were thinking about using Mushrooms, and I feel like mushrooms the mushrooms. No, but I wouldn't think it hurt. Mm -hmm. I would love to get morels of mine. Yeah. What are, um, besides the vegetation stuff, is, are, there, are there things that absolutely no nose you put in your. Oh, you, well, preferably not meat and grease. Now, originally I thought milk, but after um, after reading this book, milk's good. It feeds the feeds the bacteria. So, so are you saying you put the morels in and let them decay, or I don't let know, them I live? Was, I was joking. joking. Oh, I was going to say for the best. I hope he figures it out. He lets me know. We were sure not throwing our compost. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't know.